Good afternoon. It's uh, Thursday, the 13th of August 2015, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Uh, well, it's pretty gloomy outside here in Plymouth. Uh, it's been uh, drizzly. Sure, it was not drizzly overnight, that's for sure. Okay, it wasn't drizzly overnight, but it's been pretty, uh, pretty uh, drizzly this morning. Yeah. And uh, reports across the country are pretty variable. So we've got a little bit of drizzle, a little bit of light rain, overcastness and a bit of humidity. So there we are. And uh, uh, tomorrow, it, of course, we're going to have um, David Scott joining us from uh, north of the border. So I hope the temperature change isn't a bit too much for him. Well, indeed, because he isn't joining us from north of the border. He is actually joining us in the studio. Indeed. Yes. In the studio north of the border. OK, well, what have we got today? Uh, what better place to start than uh, a look at uh, how democracy in the UK is being totally undermined? And uh, let's come straight on to Sir Eric Pickles. Sir, Sir Eric Pickles, yes. Sir Eric Pickles is apparently to examine election fraud. Uh, so this is an announcement from the Cabinet Office, of course, that Sir Eric Pickles, the government's anti-corruption champion. I'm sorry, I, I did actually get that out without laughing, but I did all my laughing earlier on. Uh, the government's anti-corruption champion, champion is to review electoral fraud and make recommendations on what should be done to tackle it. So I suppose in a, in a sense there is an acknowledgement that there is fraud going on. Well, <laughs> I think they know why there's fraud going on. Yeah. Okay, we'll get there in a minute. Yes. Uh, the government, they say, has made great strides in improving confidence in the electoral system in, in recent years with individual electoral re registration, making sure that checks are in place to make sure that everyone on the electoral register is who they say they are. And apparently the Minister for uh, Constitutional Reform, who's John Penrose, he said, uh, most people feel British elections can be trusted to deliver whatever people have voted for. But in a changing world, we, can, we can't rest on our laurels. We must spot new and growing opportunities in our, sorry, weaknesses in our electoral system and fix them before they turn into uh, a problem like Tar Hamlets. Sir Eric's work will provide the facts we need to do this properly. And with his years of experience with local government, he is the perfect man for the job. So then um, the government's anti-corruption champion, I'm just going to say that again because it's so ridiculous. Uh, Sir Eric Pickles said, the government's rollout of individual electoral uh, registration across Great Britain is a significant advan advance in creating an electoral register that is secure from fraud. It is important that we now look at other parts of the system to identify what more can be done to improve electoral opportunities, uh, integrity, sorry. Um, so apparently this review, as I say, is uh, going to be led because they, they still have to reiterate this several times. So in the last paragraph, again, in their press release here, they say uh, this review will be led by Sir Eric Pickles in his role as anti-corruption champion. So that's about the 20th time that it states that in this. So uh, I think what they're trying to nudge in is that there is no corruption. Uh, well, uh, a call for evidence will be issued as part of the review. Views will be sought from bodies such as the Electoral Commission and the Law Commission, as well as those involved in running elections and lawyers and academic, uh, academics with an interest in the field and law enforcement agencies such as the police and the Crime Prosecution Service, which deal with such uh, allegations and offences among others. The consultation period will last for eight weeks, closing on the 8th of October 2015. Well, let's have a look at one example of potential fraud which was uh, given to us a few days ago. And this is a letter which has been sent out to people in Plymouth um, from Plymouth uh, City Council, from, from Plymouth City Council, from Nigel Spilsbury, who's the Electoral Services Manager. And you'll note that the date says as postmark. So I've put the postmark on there so you can see what date this was sent out, the 29th to the 7th, 2015. Uh, and it's regarding your postal vote. And basically what is being alleged here is that the person who received this letter, had made a postal vote in the May elections, uh, but the signature that they put on the postal vote didn't match the signature on the registration. Now, I happen to know from the person who um, received this letter that it was the same signature that he always uses, uh, and therefore there's no possibility that it didn't match. Um, however, the key point here is that it says in the text of this letter that his vote has not been counted. A, a but, the, but the election is done. And a vote's not been counted. And a vote. So this so, is at least one vote which has not been counted, but the election is done. So they didn't come to him prior to the election, having received his postal vote and query this. They waited till 
several months afterwards, and they've queried it. Uh, in the meantime, his vote kind of stands in limbo. Now, if his vote stands in limbo, perhaps there are other votes standing in limbo, in which case Plymouth, whichever seat this is, doesn't have a valid election result, or am I missing the point here, Brian? Well, I don't think you're missing the point. And uh, let's remember back to elections going on in Birmingham when uh, Lynn Homer was the chief executive and returning officer, and it was described by the Electoral Commission as a banana republic. Um, so we've got a very interesting situation. Of course, one vote not counted says, well, there's one, how many more? Um, this is Plymouth. Is this the pattern across the country? So did we have a proper election in Plymouth? And we did have some um, information about the local Labour Party getting worried about these postal votes because they were making phone calls to people to say, have you already put in your postal vote? So it seems that the Labour Party, at least in Plymouth, had some pre-election, well, well, I say pre-election, this was as the postal votes were coming in, they had concerns about the fact that something wasn't quite right. Well, those concerns, in fact, were related to uh, an allegation that there were bags of postal votes sitting in the, uh, the main sorting office in Plymouth, um, just apparently sitting there for, for no apparent reason. And uh, the question was, whose votes were they? What were they for? And uh, why hadn't they been sent to the, uh, yeah. the, the, for the count? So we would be very interested in hearing from anybody else in Plymouth who's received one of these letters. And uh, I think this is a, a subject we need to follow up on with perhaps a phone call to the uh, returning officer himself to see what explanation he has, votes not counted. Um, I think we had uh, problems with the returning officer before, uh, over problems with the vote, the count. Uh, that would be the election before last yeah. when some of the um, some of the voting slips seem to be very neatly folded into quarters, boxes of them neatly folded into quarters. And uh, of course, a lot of people were pointing out that the average person does not do this. They will very often fold it as many times as they can to keep it secret. But there's a there's another question for another time. Um, well, where do we go from that? Uh, let's just remind ourselves that the very same Plymouth City Council that seems to have had a little bit of a snag on the elections uh, is the same council that is, uh, is desperate to close down our place, our base, uh, for starting to broadcast some very interesting questions about what they are alleging is the cover-up of some quite serious sexual assault within Plymouth City Council. So um, interesting questions there. Can we rely on the council for the elections? Not sure. Can we rely on them to delve into wrongdoing? We're not too sure about that as well. Um, of course, Tony Blair, when he visited um, Plymouth while he was prime minister, said that Plymouth had been given special powers and they should use them. I um, mm. wonder what those powers were. I think we're seeing some evidence of that. I think so. Yeah. OK, well, speaking of Tony Blair... Uh, chill cotton quarry really kicking off today or is uh, angst over it anyway so Tony Blair should be dragged in shackles to the war crimes court uh, and that's according to uh, uh, the, f the father of one of the dead soldiers is Reg Keyes his son uh, Lance Corporal Tom Keyes was killed in Iraq in 2003 uh, and he's pretty upset over the, the delays the continuing delays to chill cotton of course uh, Cameron said before the election that, of course, Chilcot couldn't report until after the election, but here, here we are after the election and still no signs of a report. Um, and uh, Mr. Keyes and, and actually uh, 29 families in total have criticised uh, Chilcot for getting the balance of the uh, re report completely wrong or getting the balance of the inquiry completely wrong. Um, and uh, because Chilcot seems to be favouring um, Blair over the families, it seems to be... Can't imagine that, Mike, well, surely. So they are threatening to take uh, legal action against Chilcot um, and because they believe that the law requires inquiries to be conducted in a reasonable time frame. Um, now, uh, the government did tweet out a, a report um, from the Commons Library today um, with, some, with their excuses for why uh, the Chilcot inquiry was late. Uh, and what they said was, for example, before the report is published, opportunity was given to those criticised in the report to read and respond to the comments in the report. Um, this is known as the Maxwellization process. It has for so, some time been the standard practice to alert those criticised in inquiry reports either by simple notification 
or by showing them the text and giving them the chance to respond. Robert Maxwell took a civil legal action against the Department of Trade and Industry after it said in a 1969 inquiry report that he was unfit to lead a public company. The judge criticised the inquiry saying it was damaged. It had damaged Maxwell's reputation without giving him enough opportunity to respond. And since then, one of the procedures for warning individuals that, uh, um, that, they, that has, is known as Max, Maxwellization. So the issue with Chilcot, though, is that no time frame has been given for responses uh, to come back from those that have been criticised. And we're mainly talking about Blair here. Um, and it, according to the uh, Commons Library report here, it's uh, not entirely clear whether it means that publication must wait until all representations have been made or if individuals should just be given an opportunity to respond before publication. But I mean, it's pretty clear, bearing in mind the length of time it's taking, that they're absolutely waiting for representations to be made from Blair's side, and he doesn't seem to be making them. So. So on we go. I just thought I'd all just highlight this other thing from the Commons uh, Library report, which is the cost. So the overall cost of the Chilcot inquiry so far is just over nine million pounds. There's no figures for 2014-15 yet, but if we look at the most recent figures, 2013-14, while this drags on, the inquiry secretariat's staff costs were 895,000 pounds. The committee and advisors re remuneration, what are they doing for this money? £200,000. They're sitting there on their hands waiting for somebody to write a letter to them. It can be very tiring waiting, Mike. £200 in, <laughs> yes, £200 in travel, 241000 in office accommodation. I wish I had 241000 for UK column office accommodation and 196000 for IT and telecoms. All this money just being thrown down the toilet. Um, while we wait for uh, Tony Blair to respond, and uh, he should be prosecuted for that, never mind all the rest. Yeah, absolutely. Well, at least the uh, families are now uh, deciding that uh, they, they may need to take some action. So uh, people standing up to be counted, we always think is a very good thing. Uh, well, on the subject of who's telling the truth, of course, uh, Britain's intelligence agencies are in the middle of the mire somewhere. And uh, we've been fascinated to see this article from a number of different sources, but we decided to go uh, from Russia today here. Degrade, deceive, discredit, psychologist condemned for aiding GCHQ uh, manipulation techniques. Now, this follows um, uh, hot on the heels of um, releases uh, by Mr. Snowden of Dirty Tricks going on. And uh, he put into the public domain a... Uh, a document, a briefing document, which was talking about just how dirty our security services have got. Uh, but the point of this article is that this uh, lady psychologist was employed to work for GCHQ in order to teach the GCHQ staff how to do some pretty dirty stuff. And uh, although nobody is alleging that this lady did anything wrong by doing what she did, uh, many of her colleagues are actually saying, well, we don't like what she did uh, because they think it's, un, um, it's undermining uh, what uh, psychologists think they should be doing, which is, according to them, trying to help people. Um, so if we just have a look at a bit of this, um, her paper is very interesting because not only was she there to help GCHQ in this work, she also noted what GCHQ's own staff was saying and she said that uh, they characterise their work using terms such as discredit, promote distrust, dissuade, deceive, disrupt, delay, deny, denigrate, degrade and deter. The unit's targets go beyond terrorists and foreign militaries and include groups considered domestic extremists, criminals, online hacktivists and even entire countries. So this is pretty nasty stuff. Um, GCHQ, of course, said that it's aware of the responsibility that comes with the nature of its work. And in addition to the legal accountability, we also take the ethic, ethical considerations surrounding our mission seriously. So um, interesting stuff. You're employing a psychologist to teach your staff how to get in on social media and disrupt, undermine people. It's this pretty, pretty negative. Pretty nasty, negative stuff. And of course, they do it with taxpayers' money. So here's GCHQ being paid to get in and to undermine people. And as we're going to see in this document, 
also creating stress and tension between groups. So this is part of the, um, the original presentation. Uh, you'll see at the top, it's uh, got secret on it. Uh, the art of deception with the GCHQ logo. Training for a new generation of online covert operations. Now, this has been available on the internet for some time. What we thought it was time to bring it back into the public domain. Um, so this is part of it, human, human science operations cell. And this is the sort of thing they're up to. So let's have a look at what it says here. Effect, uh, create cognitive stress, create psychological stress, create effective stress, um, and uh, exploit shared effect there. So this is really nasty stuff. And uh, if this was being in used in a time of war against an enemy state is one thing. But we now know that this is being done in peacetime, not only against foreign um, nation states, but also against the UK public on the basis that somebody somewhere decides that the UK column, for example, are a group who need to be watched and undermined. And if that's not enough, of course, it was The Guardian that pointed out the operation of this group, uh, the 77th Brigade. So here was the army recruiting uh, amongst army personnel for soldiers who could come in and work on social media. And they're going to be trained in non-lethal warfare. But of course, what we're, we're seeing is that there is now a, a collaboration between uh, intelligence services uh, British police, the so-called special branch units, and indeed the military to counter David Cameron's terrorism. So are, um, is the British Army unit actually working in a military sense, or is that another group of people that are actually working to spy on the British population and to undermine, discredit, create stress amongst them? Well, if we wanted some evidence, we can't trust our security services. We'll just come back to this Guardian article, um, which um, uh, pointed out, when was this? 2009, uh, that uh, Mussolini was actually recruited by MI5. Um, the man who actually did the work was Sir Samuel Hoare, an MP and MI5's man in Rome who ran a staff of 100 British intelligence officers. Now, the money they pay to Mussolini equates to £6,000 a week in today's terms. So this was not small amounts of money for a small operation. This was clearly very large amounts of government money being put in to uh, create what? Another dictatorship, divide another country. We'll leave you to research that on your own. Uh, but we've also had this, which we've talked about before. A nice little meeting between Google, Apple and telecom giants meeting behind closed doors in a remote English mansion. And of course, who was also present? Um, uh, CIA heads and uh, people from uh, GCHQ. So the British public shut outside those doors. Meanwhile, these organisations mixing with corporate giants to decide how they're going to actually... Uh, pull out our information as fast as possible. Mm. Where does it lead? Well, we thought we'd bring up a uh, personal example because of course, while Lord Leveson was claiming that he was gonna help tidy up um, um, hacking by the press, and on the basis of that, what he was clearly doing was bringing in state control of the media. We had one question for Mr. Leveson, or I certainly did, and that is how did one of my personal emails sent to one single third party end up in the trial bundle for a case in Scotland involving the former head of Scottish law, Eilish Angelini? Hacking, mm. it would seem to be. So there we are. Have people warned about this? Well, absolutely. Uh, just have a look at these quotes, which uh, we found online. Former Chief Constable of Devon and Cornwall, John Alderson, said the following about MI5's expansion into organised crime. It is fatal to let the Secret Service into the area of ordinary crime. MI5 is not under the same restrictions as the police. They infiltrate organisations, people's jobs and lives. They operate almost like a cancer. 
At the moment, the acorn of a Stasi, the former East German Communist Secret Service, has been planted. It is there for future governments to build on. Now, I don't have a, d a date for that statement. You might find it on the source website, mi5.com. But uh, they also have more uh, very interesting quotes. And this is from a book, Enemies of the State, by former private detective Gary Murrah, Murray. I beg your pardon. He describes how MI5 hired him. We had, a serious pr we had serious problems for years. It's now manifestly obvious that we have lost track of our true identity and role. We waste a considerable amount of our time investigating people who are in no way associated with the espionage or subversion. To make matters worse, we have our own subversive clique within the service. He's talking about security services who are a law unto themselves. And um, from The Guardian here, of course, The Guardian is saying, well, these people are not only spying on us. We now know that British security services were involved in the torture of individuals around Guantanamo Bay. And um, this sort of stuff is not going away because MI5, for example, is growing exponentially. Uh, these were figures for people employed, 4,100 um, we're going back to 2011 for that. But note the branches, bugins, uh, sorry, bugging, break-ins and surveillance, protective security, security of state offices. We'll be coming back to that. Internal surveillance of subversives, trade unions, radicals, campaigning groups and counter espionage against hostile groups. But this organisation saying it's there um, to look after um, senior members of the government. Uh, why are we interested in that? Well, let's remind ourselves of this little wiring diagram for yesterday, where we showed that everything to do with the investigation of uh, child abuse, where the police simply are not doing their work, comes back to the controlling hand of Theresa May and David Cameron. And if anybody doubts that, then just have a look at this from MI5's personal uh, website, it says very clearly that David Cameron is responsible for the UK intelligence machinery as a whole. So we're going to ask if he's, in, if he's responsible for the whole UK intelligence machinery, how is it this organisation can't identify and track paedophiles mm. in Parliament and Westminster? It's in your face, Mike, this stuff, isn't it? When we, when we really st start to ask the basic questions, Millions upon millions of pounds spent on uh, surveillance, spying, um, hacking of emails by Britain's intelligence services, but none of them had any idea about the paedophiles operating around government. Complete nonsense. On the other hand, what we've got going on is this. And uh, of course, across the website now, there are more and more supposedly individuals. Are they real or are they in fact computer generated? persons are attacking people who are trying to expose the abuse of children. And uh, we're going to ask a key question. Is it the case that GCHQ and MI5 are turning a blind eye to individuals attacking those exposing child abuse? Or is it GCHQ and MI5 actively facilitating the breakup of uh, people working to expose just what's going on with children? Whatever, whatever it is, uh, we now know that, of course, GCHQ is prepared to use high-level psycholo psychologists to learn exactly how to get in amongst uh, social media to break it down. Mm. Well, if you haven't uh, had a look on the website recently, uh, we have a new article up, which is an analysis of the trial of Ben Fellows. We think this is well worth reading. Nobody else is coming in at this angle. Uh, we've taken a look not only at the history and the lead up to Ben Fellow's trial, uh, but John Roper has done a particularly good job in analysing the um, comment, such commentary as there was after the trial. And uh, we've given due credit in that article to other alternative media groups who did take the trouble to go to the trial and report. So if you're interested in Ben Fellow's and that uh, case, uh, do have a look at the UK column website.
Right, well, there was uh, quite a bit of chat on the chat box yesterday about gold, so I thought it was timely that the FT published this article today. Gold demand falls to six-year low, and they're saying that this is as a result of China and India uh, having less demand internally, um, and the fact that uh, um, central banks are buying less and less gold at the moment. Um, they are saying, however, that uh, European investors, in quotes, uh, while not large enough to boost the price, increased their investment in gold due to uncertainty over Greece and the euro. I think it goes a bit beyond that. Um, but, you know, what we've got to remember here, of course, that gold is a commodity like any other uh, in, to some degree. Uh, and we've got to look at the overall situation in the financial system at the moment. Uh, commodities as a whole are collapsing in price at the moment. Um, price of oil, it's at a new low. Uh, and in fact, there's some, as, as Ian Crane talked about on Fracking Nightmare on uh, Mon Monday night, um, there's some talk that OPEC, in fact, has been hiding the true quantity of the amount of oil that they've been producing in the last uh, period of time. And so it's very likely that we're going to see oil uh, prices collapse to you know, around $30 a barrel. Um, it's in the mid-40s or something at the moment. Uh, and uh, so many commentators now talking about the fact that commodity prices um, are in a very similar situation to the, the situation we saw just prior to the 2008 financial crash. Um, we've got uh, other turmoil within the financial markets uh, as the South America, in particular Brazil, continue to be attacked. And we've got China being attacked uh, on, on its stock market and so on with uh, short selling activities uh, attempting to undermine the BRICS nations, basically. Uh, and uh, we've got a surging uh, value of the US dollar at the moment. Again, another thing that was seen just prior to the financial crisis of 2008. Um, and, uh, and we're seeing uh, wholesale uh, inventory stock on both sides of the Atlantic climbing, so product not being sold. Um, so really, we're looking at a pretty nasty financial situation again. And of course, all the cards have been played. There's n there are no cards left to play. Um, and uh, if when this next crash happens, and some people are talking about it happening as soon as uh, September, um, mm -hmm. then uh, really the central banks have no answers to it uh, other than war. And I think as, as uh, um, we're Russia was saying right, yesterday, yeah, yeah as we were saying yesterday, as Russia is pointing out, these two um, policies are linked. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have said many times we're living in a dictatorship, and I think this demonstrates it more than anything else. Uh, some people have mentioned this in the chat box already today, but this is an incredible situation. Uh, Ian Crane been uh, warning about it for that this was coming for quite a number of weeks now. For anybody that's been watching Fracking Nightmare. Um, but basically, uh, what we've got now is the government uh, removing the powers of local councils to make their own democratic decisions with regard to planning. Uh, of course, this only applies to fracking, um, thin end of a wedge, perhaps. Uh, so it doesn't matter. Central government is determined that this uh, agenda is going to go ahead, and therefore they're going to set aside democracy for this uh, particular policy agenda. Pretty incredible stuff. So um, as a result of this and the fact that there's other new fracking related news likely to come out today if it hasn't already in the last half hour or so, uh, Ian Crane is uh, uh, running a special live uh, fracking nightmare beginning at uh, 4.30 uh, this afternoon. Uh, please join us for that. It'll just be a short 30 minute uh, 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 report, uh, but do join us for that at 4.30 this afternoon, ukcolumn.org slash live. The thing's starting to move everywhere pretty quickly um, on the subject of fracking of course we've seen some really excellent video clips of um, britain's police being at their worst thuggish intimidating and pretty brutal to vulnerable people at some of the fracking demonstrations well who drives policing policy of course we've asked that question several times finger pointed quite rightly at the original acpo private company with police chiefs uh, setting out policy, uh, totally unaccountable to anybody. Uh, that's now been taken over by the... Um, MPCC. Uh, thank you very much, MPCC. Um, so policy, we think, is being driven from within UK. Well, is it? Have a look at this, which uh, came across our desk this morning. This is Altus. It's a global alliance. Um, it was setting up 
um, a network of um, police stations that could be open to visitors. And the important thing about this was that it was worldwide. Uh, this is part of a presentation actually back in October 2006. Uh, but what we're looking at here is the linking of police forces uh, worldwide. And um, I think this is known as a Trust Us organization. So what were they actually up to? Well, here's the mission. Altus is a global alliance working across continents and from a multicultural perspective to improve public safety and justice. That's the Trust Us bit. Focus on, oh, police accountability and the quality of oversight. So this organization clearly driving worldwide policing for our benefit. Relax, these people are looking after things. So as we always uh, do, we went looking to who was funding them. And uh, we were particularly interested to find the UK's Department of International Development. Um, but that was only part of the story. Let's uh, just have a look at where that takes us. Uh, because these are some of the key funders, Ford Foundation, the John D. and Catherine MacArthur Foundation, the Open Society Institute, which I know you'll like, Mike, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the JEHT Foundation, and the City of The Hague. And there we are. The program is also um, has also had support from United Kingdom's Department of International Development. So UK public money being helped to draw police forces worldwide together. Uh, but of course, the one we're interested in here alongside uh, Department for International Development is Open Society. And if you don't know this uh, so far, you need to get researching. Open Society is, of course, uh, well, it's this gentleman, a very well-known, um, what do we call him? He's not a banker, is he? he? He's just an obscenely wealthy man. Yeah, George I mean, this, this, this is the man that crashed the pound uh, when we were trying to get into the exchange rate mechanism. Um, this is the man that brags. He, he, is, he, is, a, 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 he is Jewish and he uh, lived, um, was it? Uh, Eastern Europe. Well, it was Eastern Europe. I can't remember where exactly, but he does brag about the fact that he was um, helping the Nazis deliver um, letters to um, his fellow Jewish community members um, whenever they were about to have their property seized and have their... Um, themselves deported to other parts of Europe. So he was quite happy to take part in that process in the 1930s. And I think that gives some insight. And it, it, he talks about it in his own biography and, and brags about it. So he, uh, it does give some in, insight into, into his mind, I think. Right, So and vast amounts of money on the change program. This is why Putin has busily thrown out Soros and many of his non-government organizations. Absolutely. But this um, Altus is saying that we should we should trust them to organise worldwide policing. What's really behind it is Soros there with whatever he describes it towards a new policing paradigm. Now, of course, the Department for International Development is the department which manages the UK aid budget. And of course, most people think that the UK aid budget is being used to provide uh, yeah. drinking water and part, you know, clean drinking yeah. water in parts of Africa and things like this. But in fact, perhaps what we're seeing here is UK aid money being used for a global political purpose. I think that's absolutely what it is. But at least the truth is starting to come up to the surface. And we better say on this one, don't just believe us from the slides we've put up today. Get on the internet and have a look at it yourself so that you know what we're saying is true. Well, we're going to go overseas again in a minute, I think. Are we? Uh, I think so, Mr. Anderson, or not? Oh, yes, I completely forgot. Yes, earlier I uh, spoke to uh, Mark Anderson um, so he's not with us live, but uh, let's get this sorted out. Um, and uh, we we were talking, well, we began by talking about um, the uh, giving an update on the situation, the, uh, on the campaign in Canada to bring back uh, public credit in Canada. Uh, Canadian Central Bank uh, Canada basically had a public credit system which ran from the mid 1930s until the mid 1970s, if I remember correctly, um, when the central bank changed its uh, its policy and. Uh, and came under the umbrella of the Bank for International Settlements. Um, so there is a, a, a legal process going on around that. And, and so that's what we began talking about. Um, and this is, I think, about 15, 20 minutes. So. Just before we go there, uh, just a final comment, yeah. if I may. Uh, let's remember that uh, Eric Pickles, of course, who is the, um, what is he, the anti-corruption man, um, was described in the Telegraph as a pink geisha. 
gliding across his office. Uh, that's a good image of, of Mr. Pickles, I think. And somebody has said in the chat room that the famous quote from Stalin, if that's correct, is it's not the people who, who vote that count, it's the people who count the votes. Yes. Which probably says it all. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so once again, I'm delighted to welcome Mark Anderson from American Free Press. Hello, Mark. How are you doing today? Oh, fine. It's just been a busy week since I was on here last, Mike, but it's great to be back. Okay, well, we'll get straight to it. Um, you, uh, when, when was this article published? This is, this is six months ago, was it? A little less. It was this past spring, um, and it has to do with a little known or little publicized item from the Committee for Monetary and Economic Reform, or Comer, out of Toronto, Canada. It's a think tank there, and unbeknownst to many, even in the alternative media, Comer has filed a very interesting and ultimately very landmark lawsuit against the government of Canada, uh, basically on the basis that the Bank of Canada was, between 1938 and 1974, was a publicly spirited institution uh, by law required to issue government, uh, excuse me, issue money to the government interest-free and for the common good unlike the private central banks and commercial banks of today, which are purely for their own profit and gain. So if this lawsuit were to prevail, and it's an uphill battle for Comer, to be sure, if this lawsuit were to prevail, the Bank of Canada, the Central Bank of Canada, would be required to issue money to the national and provincial governments, and even the municipal governments, free of interest, free of usury, as was the case between 1938 and 1974. Yeah, so and, this, and indeed, uh, Canada did very well during those years. That's that's the general understanding. That's when their national health plan that many of us know about was put together, the St. Lawrence Seaway engineering, and other advancements in infrastructure and health care across the board were done in those years. And so, kind of like the Bradbury Pound issue that the UK column often publicizes, this would head the same general direction in making the monetary system for the common good rather than for the good of the world bankers. Now, Comer has, has uh, uh, created an update or has issued an update on this. What, what, are, what, what is the update and, and where are they at with it then? Well, uh, basically, uh, this past January, they, they, they won one aspect of the case. And as was reported in that earlier American Free Press article, which you can also uh, inquire about through AmericanFreePress.net. But then since then, and I'm looking at something that I've uh, been putting together as an update, um, the government of Canada was supposed to respond by March 29, and Comer expected the, the matter to be basically tossed aside, that the courts would not continue to hear the case. Uh, there's a lot of legal maneuvering and legal ins and outs that are really complex and we need not go there, but suffice to say that the government of Canada did not uh, uh, vacate or, or, or uh, stop, how, how would I say this right? The courts were allowed to continue looking at this. The, the government did not request the courts to throw the case out by March 29. So what's happened since I wrote that article is, simply put, is the case is still alive. And the Comer group is cautiously optimistic that um, this is a good sign that they have at least a fighting chance to restore the Bank of Canada uh, to its proper role that it had in those years between 38 and 74. Now, Rocco Galati, he's a attorney for Comer. He says that this... Um, that the fact that the government had to file an appeal uh, by by March, by the end of March, but the fact that it didn't do so, see, there's a lot of legal complexities here. He's calling that a sweet victory because here's what he says, the government will now have to produce substantive arguments. And that's according to the Comer newsletter that you've posted a moment ago, that you're yeah. posting now, excuse me. And Rocco Galati, the Comer attorney, also was quoted as saying, they, the Canadian government, have to actually justify why they haven't been giving interest-free loans to the government. 
they have to justify why the minutes of meetings of the Bank of International Settlements in Zurich, Switzerland, why those minutes are kept secret. They have to justify why the Minister of Revenue of Canada is not tabling the true figures of revenues coming in. They have to justify all this in law. So this is very significant, even though Comer may seem like the underdog in this titanic battle here, but it, it needs to be better publicized throughout the alternative media, uh, particularly because the regular mainstream media has all but blacked this out. So, so, um, so this, is quite, this is a fascinating situation that we actually have the Bank for International Settlements, an establishment, it was the central banker's bank, it is the, the, the sort of head of the snake, as it were, the central banking snake, um, that this has been brought into uh, a, a legal process, is quite, particularly bearing in mind even the vast majority of MPs uh, and other elected repre representatives would not admit to even knowing what the Bank for International Settlements is. Uh, that that's that's quite a they've, that's quite a success for them to bring to bring that organization its minutes its secrecy into a, a, a legal process. It really is uh, the Bank of International Settlements, and you put it so well, Mike. Is the central bank of the central banks in Basel, Switzerland? Uh, maybe that's what they met years ago when John F. Kennedy referred to the gnomes of Zurich. At any rate, um, you make a great point, and it's very significant for BIS, as it's called for short, the Bank of International Settlements, to be included in this, to even be mentioned, is notable. And I'll, I'll quote another item earlier in this in this matter. And Comer first followed this, excuse me, first filed this lawsuit in December of 2011. That's when all this started. But uh, basically, Comer says that the Bank of Canada, the Queen. Canada's Attorney General, its Finance Minister, Canada's Minister of National Revenue, quote, are engaging in a conspiracy with the International Monetary Fund, the Financial Stability Board, and the Bank of International Settlements to undermine Canada's financial and monetary sovereignty. So that really succinctly spells it out, and that's one reason the Canadian regular media has all but completely buried this. And it's really unfortunate, and it could give a lot of impetus, given that Canada is, you know, basically, a, you know, connected to the Queen of England, you know, that it's a, a commonwealth, an extension of the crown. Uh, it could have a very significant impact, at least to some extent, on the, uh, on the Bradbury Pound movement, because that could follow at least a generally similar path uh, if it were to be enacted. Uh, well, of course, we've got to remember that, uh, of course, Mark Carney is uh, an ex-head of the uh, Canadian Central Bank, so he is currently governor of the Bank of England. I would imagine he, he's going to be pretty reluctant to uh, to, to go that direction. Um, but uh, we wish them all the best. Um, do, we, do they have any idea yet how long uh, this is likely to take? No. Um, I'll, I'll be having more conversations with the Comer people, but this is pretty much breaking news or it should be and that's why we have people like you and people like me reporting these things uh, to fill this huge vacuum out there on such important issues and the kind of recovery and the kind of reforms that this could bring about are mind-boggling uh, way beyond the scope of today's show um, the the benefits would just be innumerable and at any rate though it's it's an important thing to take note of uh, it's by no means a slam dunk for Comer. It's going to be a tough battle, no doubt. The bankers are probably scratching their heads and fretting at about, you know, at, at this point, fretting like Jimi Hendrix on a guitar solo. But, um, you know, the, the press is supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So if, if the bankers are the comfortable, then maybe they're afflicted here. We'll see. Uh, well, indeed, because, of course, uh like the Bradbury Pound, this is actually a real historical precedent and it's not something that can run away from easily. Exactly. This was actually installed. This actually was enacted between 1938 and 1974. Absolutely right, Mike. They've been there once. They can go back again. Yeah. And, and that, that has to be strongly emphasized. Okay, well, uh, let's uh, change the subject then, Mark, and move on to uh, uh, Hillary. Um, who seems, as I mentioned last week, seems to be having a bit of a harder time. Um, but uh, this is a fascinating article that you've uh, highlighted here. 
um, that Hillary Clinton's mega donors are also funding Jeb Bush. Um, I would imagine that shouldn't come as a surprise to too many, but nonetheless, it's interesting that it's, uh, it's hitting the news. It is, although it's hitting the news in a sort of oblique angle, Mike. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at the details here on my laptop. It's, it's hitting the news on places like the dailybeast.com, but the big profile news, NBC, ABC, CBS, all these, these uh, big media are, are all but ignoring this if they've touched it at all. I haven't seen it on there. And you have, and these aren't necessarily household names, but they're big donors. You have people like Sarah Morgan giving $6,700, almost 7000 to Hillary for 2016, and nearly that amount for Jeb for 2016. And you have others, um, excuse me, dealing with some computer issues. John Tyson of Tyson Chicken. Uh, that's a huge chicken magnate uh, out of Arkansas, and he goes way back with Hillary and Bill Clinton to the days of when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas and him and Hillary were literally running a crime syndicate out of Arkansas. And that is not even the slightest exaggeration. And John Tyson gave 25 grand to Hillary and 27 grand to Bush. And so what, what, what the news is here isn't so much that this is happening, although it's very notable, but how ideologically different can Hillary and Jeb be if donors like that are giving like or similar amounts to both of them? What that clearly means is it doesn't matter who wins. Uh, these two horses from the Bilderberg stable are going to enact approximately the same policies. Uh, if it really mattered left, right, Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal who won, you wouldn't see this kind of thing. So it's more of the evidence that American presidential elections in particular, not just congressional and senatorial, but particularly pr presidential elections are just a circus. It's all, it's all just a put on as the media micromanages everything and they, they make it so it seems like you only have Hillary or Jeb to choose from, that anyone else is a waste of your time or at least a diversion. So this is just more proof if we needed any that presidential elections in the U.S. are meaningless. Um, well, in the meantime, Hillary has agreed, apparently, to hand over her personal email server to the FBI. I'm quite sure she's had plenty of time to deal with any uh, dodgy material that may have been uh, uh, stored on that. But nonetheless, um, is, this, are, is her past going to come back and bite her? I mean, it should do, but is it going to? Is it going to? I don't know. I mentioned on your last show last week that somehow, some way, the American press acts as if Hillary wasn't alive prior to about 2002, 2003. Like she just popped out of an egg somewhere around the year 2000. The scandals of the Clintons go back into the 90s and 1980s and even before. Uh, Bill Clinton was, of course, cozy with the Marxist regime before the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, Hillary was into innumerable far left-wing causes that, of course, you know, had their free speech right to exist and express their views, but her scandals are, are just legion. And so whether Hillary will survive is a good question. There's all the reason in the world that um, a lot of her past should be brought out. You know, she's not just running for dog catcher here or tax assessor. She's running for president of the United States. And she'd be the first woman president on top of it. That's at least a side note. And, you know, for the press not to be more curious than just about these emails is itself very curious and, and really quite aggravating for people like you and I that actually like to do some press work and not just follow trends like, you know, is Donald Trump having another argument with the uh, lady from Fox News, which is going on ad nauseum. So... You know, a lot of this is just the fact that the press is failing the people on both sides of the pond. Yeah, I mean, the first, if that's the best they can do, the first woman president isn't going to uh, be much more successful than the first black president. I don't mean that in a race sense. I actually mean that in the sense that if you choose your president on the basis of them being a minority whether or, or, or a, uh, being viewed as a minority, whether that be a woman or a or a black person or whatever your your choice is, then you're, you've got to be 
a bit more discerning than that. If that, if your only reason is to choose them because of one for one reason, you're going to get somebody that perhaps isn't the best person for the job. Exactly. Uh, that's where the political correctness comes in, as we know. As a footnote, too, here in South Texas, where I've been spending some time, uh, Hillary reportedly was just here uh, to get some money from some very big donors down here. And Jeb Bush is supposed to be speaking here in latter August in the McAllen area, which is a, a fairly big city between uh, Brownsville and Laredo near the Mexican border. And Jeb Bush they won't even reveal where Jeb Bush is going to appear unless you pay a thousand dollars a plate for the fundraiser. Then you're given notice as to where Jeb will appear. Right now, they're not even telling the media where he's going to be. Uh, I think it's around August 24. So Hillary and and Jeb are both uh, visiting the same area to do fundraising, and. Um, Hillary's been here before in South Texas using a bunch of politically correct arguments, taking advantage of the uh, female Latino vote, convincing them that she's their friend when she really just comes down here to see some big donors, uh, smile, wave, and take off and go back to her jet set lifestyle. It's just, it's just such a put on. Well, I mean, this is a, an interesting point because we're starting to see this in many places. For example, David Cameron visited Plymouth um, a few days ago. Who, who in Plymouth knew that he was coming? A very select few knew that he was coming. And we were highlighting on the UK column news a couple of days ago that, there uh, you go. that, that Harper in Canada is also um, requiring people to sign um, non-disclosure agreements if they manage to get a ticket for one of his events. Uh, they're not allowed to report what goes on uh, inside the event. They're not allowed to take any photographs while they're inside the event. They're certainly not allowed to tweet about it while, while the event is on. Or afterwards, uh, and uh, and they can be thrown out of that event for any reason at any time. So it's a pretty incredible situation where we have politicians who are supposed to be in the public eye, basically hiding from us. Yeah, they're in public, and yet they're not. Uh, it reminds me of what a school board guy t said years ago at a school board meeting. Uh, this is illustrative of the mindset all the way from the local to the top level. He said, you know, school board meetings. He told the audience they're not really public meetings. They're private meetings that we hold in public and we let you watch, <laughs> which was an incredible statement, you know, like they're in some sort of terrarium or, or uh, you know, fish pond. And we're just kind of looking on, you know, and it's it's good of him to be so magnanimous to let us look at their at their private meeting that just happens to be in a public building. And, and that's always stuck in my mind, even though this was some insignificant Michigan superintendent at a school, a headmaster, as you'd call him over there, I suppose. But it, it's illustrative of the elite mindset all the way up and down the political ladder. You know, we're public, but we're not. We're in the public eye, but don't you dare take a picture. If if you tweet, we'll sense it, we'll, we'll, we'll surveil that, and we'll throw you out. Uh, it's just incredible. Um, and as you know, the, all the parallel actions of Harper and Cameron and Bush all behaving the same way at the same time. Indeed. Um, right, Mark, we've, we've got about uh, two minutes left. I think uh, you'd wanted to sort of uh, touch on the Planned Parenthood uh, story. What, what, what had you in mind there other than the obvious? Well, I, I would just want to point out that many in the alternative media, I think, overlook the abortion issue. And many in the alternative media, uh, fans, consumers, as well as producers, tend to take the more left-leaning view of abortion. And they don't realize at one level, I think, that abortion is tyranny in action, that it is the elimination of parts of the population. We sit here and we worry about FEMA camps. We worry about concentration camps being set, out, set up. These are in the blogosphere. You know, they're urban legends. There's some truth to them. There's a lot of exaggeration. But on the one level, uh, we're, we're talking about tyrannical government under the guise of free choice, operating in plain sight and eliminating large parts of our population. But beyond that, the Planned Parenthood argument in the U.S. is now that Planned Parenthood was caught on tape selling aborted baby parts for profit. Now, what I want to point out is there's a bill in the U.S. Congress, S-1881, that would cut off all federal funding for the Planned Parenthood Federation, which is the top abortion provider in the U.S. and one of the top ones in the world. Uh, what I'm pointing out here is, is 
if selling aborted baby parts on the market for profit isn't enough to get the U.S. Congress to act, isn't enough to get the U.S. Congress to at least cut federal funding all the way for Planned Parenthood, then I would throw up my hands, and many of us should, as to just what kind of moral depravity would it take to get the people uh, in the U.S. and abroad to, to act resolutely. I mean, I guess I'm wondering where people's boundaries are here. This is very, very serious. Uh, this is way beyond the normal pro, pro-life, pro-choice uh, paradigm. And I just, I want to point out that there is legislation and what we're looking at in the near future is something that's going to show whether the U.S. Congress has any spine or, 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 or excuse me, any spine at all left whatsoever. And this, this issue will help measure whether that backbone exists anymore or not.